So welcome, welcome ladies and gentlemen, welcome everybody to today's lunch talk with the following title, Restoring European Security from Managing Relations to Principal Cooperation. Our discussion today's, uh, today follows on the, or follows on from the event in May, which uh, discussed the role of civil society and its visions uh, for a new European peace order. It was agreed that today's uh, NGOs, which emerged from the movements of the 80s, of the late 80s, uh, should again participate more in the discourse on European security. Uh, while last time it was mainly about um, looking back, not only, but mainly, today we won't try to look forward and discuss promising trajectories, approaches, approaches for a restoration of uh, European security. Uh, because um, most of us feel that the, or see that the European security is in a bad state and a bad condition. So this is the, the purpose of our uh, event today. And uh, for this purpose, we have a very excellent panel of experts today. Uh, the panel is excellent because, uh, last but not least, we have a Pole, a German and a Russian on it, and uh, a moderator from neutral Austria, so the, we have perfect conditions. Um, I would now like to introduce these guests very briefly. Um, first, we have Ute Fink Kramer. Um, she is a, policy, a peace policy expert, former member of the German Bundestag, where she uh, worked a lot. She was very engaged in arms control, disarmament issues, and uh, yeah, peace politics. Uh, our second guest is Irina Busigina, professor at the Higher School of Economics uh, and director of the Center for Comparative Governance Studies. And uh, our third guest uh, is Lukasz Kulesza, Deputy Head of Research at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Former, he was uh, director, was a research director at the European Leadership Network. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and uh, my name is Simon Weiss, and I'm a researcher at the Regional Office for Cooperation in Peace in Europe of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. So um, I would like to start uh, with Lukas um, because he's a member of the Cooperative Security Initiative. Um, and the title uh, of our today's discussion is the title of uh, our latest report from this initiative. And um, Lukas, what interested you in this, in the participation uh, and approach of this project and to what extent are the steps, um, short, mid and long term, um, proposed as a result, uh, politically feasible uh, from your perspective? Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for the, the invitation uh, and uh, the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, our work, uh, and I, I won't go into the, the details uh, of describing uh, the, the project uh, and the products, uh, and everybody uh, can just have a look uh, the cooperative security initiative dot org. Uh, website is is up and running, uh, and uh, on this uh, website uh, you find not just the details uh, of the, who are the experts involved and how we uh, how we work, but uh, most crucially uh, the the report. Uh, which uh, I still have in this uh, traditional form, but you can easily uh, download it. Uh, so the, the initiative uh, convened uh, by uh, your office, your regional office in Vienna and by, by Globsec um, with the support uh, of, of OSC Secretary General uh, and uh, the, the, the Secretariat. Uh, but uh, I have to say that at the very beginning, uh, I thought, uh, oh my God, not again. 
not another group of experts and not another report uh, on the work of the OSCE and of the state of the OSCE, because we had uh, a number of such reports, uh, some even recent, and they uh, were done by people much, wise, much wiser than me. Uh, uh, but uh, then the recommendations uh, were usually uh, politely listened to and then ignored, let's put it uh, like this. Uh, so I was I was relieved that we took a, a different route that we didn't discuss OSCE work as such or the or the inner uh, uh, problems challenges and prospects of the organization but but we took cooperative security concept as as a point of departure because that allowed us to do to look a little bit uh, broader and ask some of the first order questions of why are we doing, uh, what are we doing, uh, or uh, where, where are we now when it comes to European uh, security. Uh, and it's, it's been a diverse uh, group of, of experts, uh, and I would just to say how, how great it was to cooperate and discuss with them all, and we had some pretty intense discussions uh, on some issues. But I think uh, uh, what we had in common uh, despite nationalities, regions of origins, uh, political outlooks, uh, two things. One, uh, concern about the gravity of the situation, the trajectory of developments uh, in Europe. And then second, uh, the conviction that we can actually do better. We can do better and we should do better uh, as community of states, but also as concerned citizens um, of uh, the OSC uh, area. But we, we started in a bit of traditional way in terms of, you know, that if, if we think about report, what should be in the report, how we should write it. Uh, but then we thought, no, let's, let's reverse it a, a little bit. And let's start with formulating a list of questions uh, that uh, we uh, would be interested in having responses to ourselves. The questions about how people feel uh, about the state of relations in, 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 in Europe. Uh, do they feel that the current situation is the optimal one? What do they fear? Uh, what are their hopes when it comes to, to, to security? Uh, then going a little bit into details, do they see Russia as part of European security system? Do, you see, do they see the United States as part of the European security system? Uh, do they see common values uh, as a prerequisite for cooperation? So we came up with uh, 19 questions uh, because we also expanded to uh, the, 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 the questions about the consequences of, of COVID. Um, and uh, no, ideally, uh, we would force all OSC ambassadors in Vienna, all diplomats and all leaders to, to basically sit down and take this questionnaire. Um, but uh, we just put it out there for everyone to, uh, to, to fill up. Uh, and I think we ended up with uh, around 300 uh, set of responses, uh, which informed uh, our work uh, and we cite uh, the, the results in the report. Uh, but of course, this is not uh, an objective take. This is not a representative take uh, of, uh, of, of our populations. Uh, so, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily draw uh, far reaching conclusions uh, out of the percentages um, that we side, but uh, it is interesting that for the people who care enough uh, about cooperative security to fill up these forms, these were the responses that we, we had. Uh, and I'll just point out to the four scenarios that we thought come out of these uh, responses. Uh, one is uh, battleground Europe. So the idea that things goes, go even worse than they are right now, and we ended, end up with violent conflicts all over the place. Uh, second, what we called uh, the Groundhog Day Europe. So the idea that you wake up every day to almost the same situation, that there are ups and downs, uh, but you know, nothing changes. Uh, the third option, stabilized Europe. So we kind of... Uh, at least deal with the most pressing issues and uh, we make the situation, yes, stable. Uh, and then uh, cooperative Europe, uh, the, the situation in which we actually uh, overcome 
our most important differences find the ways to, to work together on a number of, of challenges. Um, and of course, uh, as you may uh, probably guess, uh, our preferred way out of the current predicament is actually to go from uh, true stabilized Europe uh, to cooperative Europe and represent uh, a number of steps, uh, short term, mid term, uh, long term that we think uh, can uh, get us uh, there. You ask about feasibility, and I think uh, when it comes to uh, the, the short term measures, uh, these are politically feasible because they do not uh, require a major reformulation of the policy of any of the of the participants uh, into into the system. Uh, things like uh, restraint in the military sphere, in the rhetorical sphere, uh, in the cyber sphere, uh, things uh, like confidence building and transparency measures, uh, preventing and dealing with incidents and accidents. Uh, with regards to the zones of conflicts and of fighting itself, ameliorating the, 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 the conditions uh, on the ground uh, and you know, helping the civilians involve, uh, pushing forward with, with negotiations, of course, uh, but without the hope of a kind of magical solution to any of the major uh, crisis. So no, these are the measures that I, I think you know, they, are, they are perfectly, I'm not saying they are easy, but they are politically feasible. Uh, but then, of course, hopefully you build on this, uh, you build on positive uh, experience to go to some of these midterm, uh, uh, more in-depth discussions and hopefully cooperation on sectoral issues. And then building on this, uh, you go to, to something that uh, looks like a, a cooperative uh, Europe uh, in which we, we all uh, kind of move in the same directions in turn, in, instead of moving in conflicting uh, directions. So this is in a nutshell the idea, but I really invite everyone to, to look into the details, look into report uh, and uh, take the questionnaire. You can still, uh, you can still see the, the, the questions that we post. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Lucas, uh, for this <clears throat> a short summary of, uh, uh, of the initiative and the report, uh, which, uh, um, yeah, um, kind of fits, uh, fits in uh, into this um, overall uh, political uh, environment right now. And we have, uh, we had three summits um, this week and uh, at their summit meeting in Geneva two days ago, President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin adopted um, uh, this US-Russian uh, joint statement on strategic stability in which they uh, reaffirmed uh, the principle that a nuclear war uh, cannot be won and must never be fought and announced that they will embark together uh, on an integrated bilateral strategic stability dialogue in the near future. This is, of course, a very good news. So uh, from at least my perspective, the, the results from this summit were better, at least in this uh, strategic stability uh, regard, as many as expected. Uh, so, uh, dear Ute, uh, with your political background and your background in this uh, uh, arms control um, sphere, what can and should the EU and Germany do to kind of uh, complement the little steps, little results uh, in Geneva or from Geneva? Yes, um, thanks, um, Simon, for the invitation. And um, I um, really started yesterday um, to prepare my statement because I knew that I had to build upon whatever um, the two presidents would um, agree on. And I found um, the statement also very encouraging. And therefore, because it's um, quite short, I'll start to um, read it um, to you because it's, um, I think not everybody um, <laughs> did read it in the original. Um, and um, I um, maybe an, an um, 
notice to um, Lukas, um, I found some um, propositions in this statement, which um, several international networks for peace and disarmament suggested to the presidents. And in, in my view, um, we are preparing um, a lot of um, material as um, political experts, as um, peace movement and so on. And we know only 1% of this material will be used by politicians, but we don't know in, in advance which 1% and we have no way to um, find it out. So we have to um, prepare all this mountain of paper or of um, digital um, documents um, for reaching um, with 1% um, of our material, the political process. And I think that's um, worth um, the, the labor. So um, the joint statement um, has um, the following um, words. We, President of the United States of America, Joseph R. Biden and President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, note the United States and Russia have demonstrated that even in periods of tension, they are able to make progress on our shared goals of ensuring predictability in the strategic sphere, reducing the risk of armed conflicts and the threat of nuclear war. The recent extension of the New START Treaty exemplifies our commitment to nuclear arms control. Today, we reaffirm the principle that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Consistent with these goals, the United States and Russia will embark together on an integrated bilateral strategic stability dialogue in the near future that will be deliberate and robust. Through this dialogue, we seek to lay the groundwork for future arms control and risk reduction measures. That's the short statement. And that is more than many of us hoped for. So the first thing to do for European and German politicians is to offer support on behalf of future arms control and risk reduction measures focused on Europe. They can refer to the recommendations of the participants of the expert dialogue on NATO-Russia military risk reduction in Europe from December 2020, formulated by a broad coalition of experts and mostly former high military personnel and diplomats from Russia and several NATO countries, especially the United States. The recommenda recommendations of these experts cover seven categories. The first is re-establishing practical dialogue between Russia and NATO, including direct contacts between the military commanders and experts of Russia and NATO member states. Second, developing common rules that will reduce the risk of unintended incidents on land, air, and sea. Third point, enhancing stability by increasing transparency, avoiding dangerous military activities and providing dedicated communication channels that would avoid escalation of incidents that might occur. Fourth, fourth point, utilizing and possibly supplementing the 19, 19, 1997 NATO Russia Founding Act to codify restraint, transparency, and confidence building measures. Fifth, exploring possible limitations on NATO and Russian conventional force deployments in Europe to enhance transparency and stability. Number six, establishing consultations between Russia and the United States and NATO on the topics of intermediate range missiles and ballistic missile defense in order to prevent a new nuclear missile race in Europe. The seventh point is preserving the Open Skies Treaty, which could be a task for the remaining parties of the treaty, many of them EU member states, 
as part of a medium term strategy to persuade the United States and Russia to participate again in this treaty. Especially German politicians can, aside from that, refer to the recommendations of the Trilateral Deep Cuts Commission, established in 2013 as a cooperation project of arms control experts from Russia, the United States, and Germany. The task of the Deep Cuts Commission is to address the key challenges to significantly lowering nuclear weapons arsenals and to devise concepts on how to overcome current challenges to deep nuclear reductions through means of realistic analysis and specific recommendations. I took that from their website. The Deep Cut Commission's last statement dates from June 6 and is titled Turning the Tide, NATO, the United States and Russia need to agree on an ambitious arms control agenda. As Russia and the United States are both members of the OSCE, and the OSCE has a long tradition of arms controls, verification and confidence building measures, neg negotiations within the OSCE frame could be a central part of the announced future arms control and risk reduction measures. There is still some distance to bridge between bilateral or multilateral predictability in the strategic sphere, reducing the risk of, risk of armed, armed conflicts in the threat of nuclear war. As the common statement of the presidents puts it, and concepts like common security, cooperative security, or principled cooperation. It would be great if the European Union and all its member countries came to a mutual agreement with the United States which confidence building measures in Europe can be a constructive contribution for the cautious new dialogue between Russia and the United States on arms control and risk reduction. Thanks, Ute. Thanks. Um, I will. I will. Uh, I would like to come back to the um, to the actors involved in the uh, European. Um, European security. Uh, it is all, of course, uh, the EU. It, it's it's Russia. It's uh, the EU's neighborhood, so-called states in between or Eastern Partnership states, but also uh, the United States. So um, many political observers um, have been surprised that a summit between the United States and Russia has come about so quickly. Uh, because something similar seems um, hardly possible between the EU, the EU and, and Russia uh, nowadays. Um, instead, um, in, instead, a kind of uh, update of the Mogherini principles came just uh, on the day of the summit in Geneva. Uh, so, dear Irina, um, question to you, uh, what actor uh, characteristics or capabilities should the EU develop? Um, you know, these um, uh, frames like Weltpolitik, Fähigkeit, uh, language of power, and so on. But I mean more the uh, smaller or more concrete uh, characteristics and capabilities uh, so that a relationship with Moscow can be established on an equal footing. And so that an EU-Russia summit uh, can be added to the US-Russia summit in the future, for example. So how should uh, the relationship between Moscow and EU be structured and what the EU should kind of uh, develop to be an equal uh, partner uh, from Russian uh, perception? in the Russian perception? Uh, okay, it's a very, it's a very complicated question. You know, if I would, if I would only know, Simon, how to, uh, how to answer it, you know, I would immediately give you the direct answer. But what I can, uh, by the way, thank you very much for inviting me here and that I'm able to take the part in this uh, discussion. 
Uh, you know, first of all, uh, Simon, I'm not an expert, as you know, I'm not an expert in neither in uh, security issues nor in uh, uh, arms control uh, policy and the, the things like this. I'm, if I, uh, probably I could represent myself as a modest expert in political relations between uh, Russia and the European Union. So what the, Perfect. you know, thinking about, thinking about what, what can the European Union do? Uh, well, if you remember what Lukas said, he said, uh, gravity, gravity is deep in the situation. This is absolutely beyond any doubt. And uh, we can do better. The, the question is, can we? Uh, can we? And what I, what I kind of uh, elaborated uh, for my uh, introductory remarks is that, uh, you know, I think for me, this is the, the Russia EU, this is the talk about incentives. You know, I see the incentives from the European, from the part of the European Union, I see a lot of incentives. I don't want to dig into that, uh, but still there are incentives and I see these uh, incentives converted into an approach. Okay, we cannot probably call this approach perfect, but who can do better? You know, having in mind the complexity of the European Union and the, the diverg divergence of national interests and the things like this. However, as you said, you know, or Mr. Lavrov said, Tanga needs two, very trivial, very, but very right. And uh, what I could, how I could answer your question also imperfectly, but still this is with three points. If you, if you, if you uh, allow me, what the European Union has to take into consideration, uh, thinking about the, about uh, shaping or framing its uh, overall approach with regards to the Russian Federation be it on the equal footing, who knows what is equal footing? You know, I, you know, this is, this is also sort of kind of very, very, very vague uh, term, if you want. But three things I want to share with you. The first thing is that uh, in Russia, there is an understanding that uh, there is nothing, sorry, sorry for being that rude. I'm really sorry. So I, I please in advance, right? Uh, but there is in my, in my guesses, in my sense, there is an understanding that, uh, there is nothing in the European Union that Russia can learn. You know, this is the things that the European Union is good at uh, being at peace and security in the broad term and the concrete term, or the, 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 I don't know, green agenda, or not to talk about the human rights. You know, this is not, the problem is that this, this overall set of, set of things is not interesting for Russia. If you, if you remember this, uh, if you compare this situation with this, uh, which existed uh, 12 years ago, uh, then it was the last, the last uh, breakthrough or the attempt uh, to break through when the president, uh, then president Dmitry Medvedev, uh, with the European Union, came forward with the uh, with the partnership for modernization. At least it was an understanding that the European Union was the all the only external call it call it actor, call it power, I don't know, but the only external somebody who would be interested in Russia's modernization. Then the question, why do we need European Union beyond market, beyond the market for our energy product? At least the answer was we need it for modernization. This agenda doesn't exist now. So my concern with regard to the EU is that it's not about that much about values, about this is about different agendas. It's about different prioritization. The, this is, was the first thing. The second thing is uh, I call it, uh, oh, oh, we are ready. This is a Russian approach, by the way, very cunning one. You know, whenever I uh, listen to the high officials of my country, or if I listen, or almost uh, whenever, or if I listen to the, which I listen and watch a lot, to the uh, talk shows, political talk shows, you know, you know, this is, this is the Russian approach. We are ready. We are always ready to, for cooperation. And this is a very kind of tricky thing, because the idea is that Russia is always ready. So who are, who, are, who are unhappy? These are you Europeans. We are happy, you know, and it looks, it, it makes it very difficult, you know, kind of to inbuilt and to, or to, should I say destroy or kind of dissolve this kind of eternal readiness. And this readiness does not correspond, this is the problem, to the actual activities of the Russian Federation. You know, this is this is this is the problem. But here, to the to the to the audience, to the to the Europe, to to our domestic audience, we are always ready. Yes, you know. But this is this is ready ready, ready to what? So we are, but we are ready. And the the um, the third point, the third point, probably this is the most important one. But uh, and this is the point about what what does Russia want? And this is from what the European Union 
should you know necessarily uh, needs to take into consideration. Does Russia want more conflict with the uh, security issues or whatever issues? I don't think so. Does Russia need less conflict? Also, the question is probably also not. What, what I have in my sense, what Russia would like really to do is to be able to control the degree of conflict, to be able to switch it kind of, you know, when we need it more, we do it more. When we need it less, we need it less, you know? So, but this, is, this will be an, a, a, another kind of uh, question. Is, it, is, it, is this uh, desire feasible? It is not. It is not, but it's still it's still there. So the idea is to kind of to be able to manipulate with the level, with the degree of tensions and the degree of problems, and switch from one, one problem to another with the uh, all the all the motto we are ready. We are ready to everything, you know. And this is this is this that makes it very. And this is by the way the last thing I want to say. This is this is for me. This is overall the explanation why uh, the Russian Federation uh, is still did not produce anything which we could call an uh, principled or based on principles, any principled approach to the European Union. You know, the European Union, okay, it is unperfect. Another, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going in, so in, 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 a, in a circle. The Euro, it is imperfect, but this is, this is the attempt to do it. Very hard, and I think very hard kind of, kind of very complicated efforts. The Russian, the Russian Federation is, does not produce, you know, the, the comparable efforts. You know, building off that we are, we are, we are, we are ready and we are happy. We are happy. You aren't happy, but we are happy. So, thank you. Thanks, Irina. You, I think you set the right tone. So, please uh, uh, let us be uh, rude and frank and, and outspoken. So, uh, um, let me um, ask you a follow up question. I think. Um, um, I like this uh, two last uh, points uh, about uh, Russian readiness. So I think, uh, from my perspective, uh, I think it it's uh, it would be worth uh, for the EU to kind of prove this Russian readiness. <laughs> uh, and to, for example, with the the steps which uh, Lukas mentioned from our joint uh, cooperative security uh, initiative, but also what uh, Ute uh, explained with the uh, little results, little steps and uh, um, in the NATO-Russia conflict zone, but also in the, uh, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of arms control and confidence building measures. So there are a lot of uh, smaller islands of cooperation, potential islands of corporations, which should be uh, negotiated, addressed, and my concern is, and it was my initial question to you, that the EU is uh, propagate, uh, propagating some kind of, uh, someone called it, uh, some, some expert called it uh, strategic indifference. So we, we have only to wait and do nothing uh, with Russia and the, the situation will change uh, on its own. So uh, we, we have to do nothing. I think this uh, second point, uh, Lukas, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll come back to you in a moment. So I think this um, uh, point with uh, proving Russian readiness, uh, even with small steps or small uh, issues uh, which ha have to be negotiated is, is a good one. And the other, this um, control of the degree of conflict. So this is, uh, resonates with the escalation dominance debate, kind of. Uh, both uh, points are, are important. But that, my question is, I think you wrote last year an article where you discussed with a co-author uh, the, I would say, the Russian uh, political logic of integration in the post-Soviet sphere. Uh, there is kind of a spectrum between domination and cooperation when it comes to, the, to partners in the so-called new abroad. Can anything be deducted from this observation for the relationship dynamics between Russia and the West? So do we have a similar, uh, I think it's kind of uh, similar to this, what you uh, uh, told or explained with the third point, this uh, Russia is trying to control uh, its relations, um, 
dominance versus cooperation. So is there a thing which we can learn uh, from, from, from your research, how to, uh, yeah, how to prove Russian readiness, how to confront or how to cooperate with Russia? Thank you, Simon. Another most difficult question. Uh, thank you very much. Today only difficult questions. Sorry. Today only difficult questions. Uh, you know, this is, uh, first I would like uh, very briefly to comment on what you said. Uh, this is uh, strategic indifference. Uh, I think this is, this is uh, at least in my, in my understanding, this is probably, I don't know, I, I think the idea is not kind of possible, you know, because the, uh, the, the European Union uh, so the, the countries of the European Union and the European Union even more so uh, do not control, you know, all the actors which would do the external relations. So with the, with the Russian Federation. Okay, you know, my idea was that what if, this was my idea and the idea of my co-author, co Mikhail Filipov. So what if the, uh, the uh, countries of the European Union and the European Union would promise Russia, would guarantee Russia, we don't interfere in your internal, in Russia's internal affairs. We don't uh, defend Navalny, we don't talk about human rights and so on. So we are, we are just, you know, would it be the, the, the good kind of ground to start proving Russian readiness, as you said, right? The problem is that this is not possible. That these are these are these are still multiple actors. So this is first the NGOs. So which are which will still you know. So so this is not possible to to split to to give such a guarantee to give a credible commitment that the, neither the European Union nor Germany nor France would ever interfere into uh, what Russia thinks is kind of contributing to Russia's possible or impossible democratization. This is not this is not this commitment can be can be kind of done. So and this is so. Uh, so this is strategic indifference is not possible. It's just an option. It's, it's, it's not a feasible option. You know, it's a good, good word combination. So what? Uh, and then this is uh, another, another thing is that, uh, yes, what we try to do, we try to see how Russia, how Russia builds their relationship with the near abroad. Near abroad is an old term, okay, with the neighboring countries formerly uh, belong to the, to the, to the, uh, they were republics of the, uh, of the Soviet Union. And uh, you know this this is again uh, kind of there are there are probably many lessons many lessons this is a very good question uh, Simon I need to think more about it but one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, for me one of the lesson is that uh, Russia is very opportunistic in a way that uh, this is the interest is not consistent you know even even to this thing even to this. A uh, fantastic Eurasian Economic Union, which Russia praised so much, and uh, this was should be, you know, after after the complete failure in the Ukraine, it it should be the replacement, a wonderful kind of vitrine to show that Russia can do, we can do, we cannot do with you Europeans, but it doesn't mean that we cannot do otherwise, you know, in, in the other in the other uh, common neighborhoods that we can do it with China, that we can peacefully share the neighborhood with China, meaning the five Central Asian countries, and so on and so forth. So the problem is that the interest, you know, it comes and go. And this is, it's not, I wouldn't call it unpredictability. It's not the unpredictability, but this is, uh, it means that it puts under question, again, the, the strength of Russian commitments to, to any project, you know, whatsoever. And this is, it makes Russia a very uneasy partner to anyone. You know, again, we are not talking about that Mr. Putin want to have this hook and unpredictability hook and hang all of you on this hook, you know, and he can do it. He thinks, OK, well, uh, but this is this is this is the this is the problem that a lot of things that Russia starts, you know, the uh, the reasons for starting it, you know, so this is this is this is again, this is for you. OK, you will you will come you will come to Russia and say, OK, Russia. Uh, let's try your let's uh, try your your uh, your readiness. You know the the problem is that that Russia that you cannot rely even if Russia says yes. You know it can it can be yes today and no tomorrow and I don't know in a week. You know and this is and this is you know and and a lot of objective reasons of why. So it means this is this is this, this kind of partner. You know is very so. I try to answer, but there are also many other Thanks. lessons. And thank you very much for this very, Thanks. very, very good question. Thanks, Irina. I think uh, Lukas had um, um, a question or a two finger to this to this issue. 
Uh, yeah, a, a couple of points, uh, if, if I may, you know, starting sure. with uh, the, the, the reports and recommendations that uh, Ute uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, I, I have been participating in some of these, these discussions. Uh, and I think that it's almost too many of these recommendations and, and proposals. And they go in many different directions. And frankly speaking, if you look from Warsaw, some of these proposals uh, seem to go a bit uh, too far. Because if you suggest that basically uh, no major exercises and no major deployments can happen clear near the Russian border, um, it means much more for Polish security than it means, for example, for, for German or uh, Italian uh, security. So you know, the devil is in the details, but I think there are some no-brainers there, uh, including, for example, expanding the range of the military to, to military uh, contacts. Um, and it's important what, what Ute said, that it's, it's, Europe needs to be in the game I'm not sure if we can manage at the level of the European Union, but uh, a lot of our countries are members of NATO, so we can shape this debate through, through NATO, we can shape it through our uh, contacts uh, with the United States. Some also can shape it through their contacts with, with Russia, and there is a French-Russian uh, dialogue on many things that is apparently progressing without much progress. Uh, but you know, it's, it's important that as much as we like and trust the Americans, uh, we don't just leave it as uh, an American-Russian conversation. And I'm, I'm very encouraged that uh, the Biden administration is sending the signal that they like, they would like to, to, to coordinate um, and, uh, and, 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 and have a uh, conversation about it. Uh, on Irina points, I, I, I loved uh, your description of, of uh, Russian attitude towards the European Union. Uh, and uh, I have to say that on the other side, also to be uh, blunt, I, I think there is increased uh, frustration and disillusionment um, with the relationship uh, with Russia. Russia uh, and the, the uh, uh, Russia engagers, let's put it like this, they are in defensive. So people who are saying, you know, it's it's so it's so bad that we don't have a relationship. What more can we offer to Russia? What more can we put on the table uh, to make Russia interested? Um, uh, these people are in the, in the defensive because uh, according to I think EU logic, a lot of things were put on the table. Uh, and were not picked up by, by Russia, or they were picked up so selectively that basically it made sense for Russia to engage. It didn't make any sense for the EU to engage. Uh, plus, if you brought some more sensitive top topics, uh, we say, okay, let's discuss Ukraine. Uh, at this point, Russia usually responds, what is there to discuss? We are not part of any conflict in Ukraine. Uh, let's discuss Belarus. Oh, nothing is happening in Belarus. Uh, so no, it's, it's, a, it's a selective, a very selective approach to the discussion. On the other hand, the idea, you know, how can EU uh, uh, cooperate closer with the uh, with, with Russian economy and provide more investments uh, seem to be an interesting topic for uh, for conversation, or at least used to be. Um, so so I, I think that the frustration is mutual uh, and the, the frustration grew bigger uh, after Borrell's uh, visit uh, to, 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 to Moscow, uh, which uh, symbolically opened uh, many eyes that were closed uh, so far. So, so I think with the EU-Russia relations and having Borrell said it himself, uh, things uh, would go worse before they can get uh, better uh, and definitely the idea of selective engagement is down in the list of, of priorities. Uh, but on some issues that we discuss, uh, the, the, I think the dialogue will be ongoing, even if you know, no breakthroughs uh, over there. Um, I think on some of the hard, hard security issues, there is space in NATO Russia, but there is space in the OSCE, and you know it's not just because uh, the project was linked with the OSC, but I really think that the OSC uh, remains one of very few, uh, very few formats uh, that we actually still meet and we, we still 
uh, talk. And you know, I was uh, very worried, for example, when I uh, read uh, Andrei Kortunov's uh, recent piece, uh, uh, when he was discussing the, the, whether Russia should stay or leave uh, the OSCE, mentioning some voices inside Russia, uh, questioning the value of the OSCE for, for, for Moscow. And I thought, okay, we are at the very, very a uh, bad situation in which you know the even though SCE is 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 questioned. Um, but I, I, I think we if we are looking for uh forums uh for, for discussion and pursuing some of the initiatives, uh OSC has the uh, military political dimension uh but also has the economic and, and human uh rights uh, dimension. Thanks, Lucas. Um, we have um, not so much time left, but uh, I have uh, a question from the audience and Ute uh, wanted also to react um, to this issue. So Ute, please go first and then I will um, um, ask a question from the audience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I have a question to you, Irina. Um, in Germany, we are discussing um, at the moment if there is a possibility for cooperation on climate change um, with Russia um, on behalf of um, green hydrogen. Um, that means um, to, to um, produce um, with um, wind energy um, or solar energy in the big, big Russia, um, the hydrogen um, Germany needs um, for becoming free of, um, of, of CO2. So is, could that be an offer which would be interesting for Russia? Irina, please, um, you can answer right away. Mm -hmm. uh... Uh, Ute, uh, Simon, what should I answer? Should I, because I, I would like to answer the question of Ute, I would like to make the, the comments on what Lukas, very, very, very short, what, what, what Lucas said, and you also can, on, yes. what, should I, what should I do? And uh, to make it complete, I will ask you the, the question from the audience, and you have three questions, uh, basically, but I will ask you to, or I ask you to be uh, very brief in your answers, because I have a, uh, last question with, uh, which is with, which goes to all of you so the question from the audience uh, on top of the other questions is uh, do you think that the russian decision makers understand the point that nobody in europe could give a guarantee on strategic indifference due to the populism in our societies and democratic political processes pluralism pluralism not populism yeah pluralism <laughs> right pluralism. yeah <laughs> no, no. Uh, the question is uh, with uh, pluralism. Yes, yes, not populism. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. Ute, thank you, thank you for thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I think that uh, again, again, these are my guesses, right? So this is because the the question uh, go into direction. What what uh, what are what is in the heads of the elite of my country? You know, so this is this is I can I cannot I would like to 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 be able to open it and to look inside, but I can't. Uh, so my guess, uh, the answer the answer to your question is yes. Okay, at least uh, formally, this is this is a very uh, it's a more and more popular popular agenda uh, for Russia. And so here is yes. The problem is that I don't expect a spillover to the political relations. So it will that, that it will it will kind of be converted into improvement of the political relations. This is a this is a different different sphere. But this is this is, but this is a possibility. I I agree. And uh, what Lukas said, uh, yes, about about Barrel. You know, he happened to visit Moscow in a very unhappy time. Now, uh, by the way, exactly in the middle of the of the uh, protest for Navalny. Exactly when they when the 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 establishment was very much irritated because it was very unexpected what happened you know and and and, and other things but 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 I, I i generally agree with all your with what you said but what i would like to add and this is what is very important and what that the european union also needs to take into consideration that there is no no pro-european lobby in russia because you know i i try to look this is this is my topic and this is what i would love to take part in uh, but there are no no uh, kind of considerable or important NGOs, and there are no political groups. And why do you know Ute? This is this is this is this is this is was one of the consequences of the Ukraine Ukrainian 
uh, let's put it, uh, integration of the Crimea to, to the Russian Federation, because this is absolutely a red line. It's absolutely a red line. No politician in Russia would now dare to say that this was not an absolutely legitimate step from the Russian Federation. So this is this is no way, and this is and it makes this also this crossing between Europe and us. So and, and, and Russia. So this is this is okay. It's absolutely taboo to talk about this thing in Russia, uh, right? And with regard uh, with regard to the question, do the the Russian elites know that the European Union can stop penetration of the non-state uh, non-state entities or you know. Uh, I don't think that 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 this question is um, not imp kind of how should I say it rightly formulated because okay I can give you answer they don't understand if they don't understand uh, they would say just stop it to the European Union we don't know how but we don't understand just stop it from the other side if they understand it you know they would still not allow that because in their priorities you know the internal stability and the internal kind of consolidation is that much important that they would play as if they don't understand it, even if they do understand it. So, and this is, this is again, kind of the uh, difficulty. Thank you. Thanks, Irina. Thanks uh, for answering the question. Questions. Um, um, I have a question uh, to all three guests. So uh, among many, uh, because Irina right now uh, talked about uh, red lines, so uh, there is a, a other besides Crimea an, an, another uh, prominent red line, uh, at least in Russia. Um, and among many divergencies uh, of interest between the collective West, so-called collective West and, and, and Russia, one point of uh, contention stands out in particular, and that's uh, uh, NATO's so-called open door policy or the prospect of uh, NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine. And I think for, for, um, this is a fundamental divergence and the statements on this in recent days, just before the summit uh, from Russia, but uh, also during the NATO summit, uh, kind of man manifest the status quo in this respect. So the question is, if, even if we uh, de-escalate, so take uh, applying this short-term term uh, recommendations between Russia and NATO, uh, even if we leave uh, Crimea, Syria, Libya, cyber and other malign activities and some other conflict issues aside, we always come to the point of NATO enlargement to the east. So uh, it is a, is a strategic balance of interests. Uh, like in the old uh, conference for cooperation and security in Europe uh, times possible at this point? Are there B or C plans for this? So uh, who would like to answer this, uh, uh, this question first? I, don't know. I, I can I can I can go first, uh, uh, and so I, I think uh, the we should go back to to the principles uh, that we've developed during the last uh, decades. Uh, one of such principles is that non-interference uh, in internal affairs is not absolute. That we all agreed uh, that on some issues, other countries uh, can uh, comment and can, in a sense, interfere in our affairs because they are not our internal affairs. Uh, and you know, through OSC, through Council of Europe, uh, we interfere in each other's affair uh, all, all the time. Um, so it's, it's, it's not this absolute, I, I don't really see the prospects of coming back to this idea that you know, what happens in Russia is Russia's business and what happens in Poland is Poland's business. I mean, we, we kind of cancel 30, at least 30 years of our history of that. And the same goes uh, with the, the right to freely choose the alliances, which, are, which, which is there um, in a set of, of rules and, and, and principles. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, the, the Bucharest summit uh, statement. So the statement that you know, Ukraine and, and Georgia will become members of, of NATO, because it was a statement that uh, sounds res resolute, 
but it masked serious differences of opinions within the, the alliance. And some countries were, uh, because of Russia uh, and other things, uh, not willing uh, to, 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 to bring Ukraine and, and Georgia uh, in. And I think it's, it's, it's still the case if we are talking uh, honestly. So on the one hand, uh, NATO cannot say that its open door policy doesn't uh, apply, and it cannot really reverse the decision that it has taken. Uh, but uh, then in practice, you see repetition of the past uh, pledges and also a very creative way to increase cooperation uh, and contacts with Ukraine and, and Georgia, but without actually uh, crossing uh, into membership uh, territory, uh, which for me is a, it's a shame, but it's probably a topic for other discussion. But you know, we are where we are. Thanks, Lucas. So, Ute or well, so there? so I will um, try next. Um, I think it was a mistake to um, to try to to add um, Georgia and Ukraine to the. Um, well, neighboring countries which um, can have a membership action plan um, from several reasons, but one, um, I think, um, basic reason is that um, NATO tried to reinvent itself in um, 1991 as a, um, as a, as a um, cooperation um, odd organization um, based on common values. And um, I don't think that, um, well, the, the common values um, on democracy, on social justice and other topics um, in Georgia and um, Ukraine um, were at the point um, in Bucharest, but um, also now um, where we can discuss um, them as part of, of such an, um, an, an well um, organization which um, says we are based on common democratic and and um, social values. So um, that's one point, and um, the consequence from it is um, that we should cooperate um, very seriously with um, Ukraine and Georgia not only on formal democratic values, but also on um, things like social justice and, um, and real um, well, participation um, of um, the, the um, stakeholders in the own society um, on political decisions. And um, that means um, cooperation on the communal level, for example. And um, I know the Friedrich Ebert Foundation is um, very engaged in such, um, well, um, discussions in not only with Eastern European countries, but worldwide. So that could be a point um, for Friedrich Ebert Foundation as well. Thanks, Ute. Irina, please. Uh... Yeah, one, 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 or one or two sentences. Uh, well, I absolutely, absolutely agree with Lukas. Yes, this is this is the 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 free joining of the international alliances. This is this is again absolutely the the free choice of any sovereign state. You know, so this is nothing nothing you know could say against this. So this is this is if the country want and if the alliance is ready. So I don't. Yeah, but but this is yes, and this is and then and then comes not no, but then comes. Uh, Yes, if if and, and and we know how many years do Georgians wait for it? You know, it's not not the Ukraine much, 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 much earlier. You know, has Georgia Georgian government expressed the the the, the wish to join to join the the uh, the alliance? But uh, at the same time, you know, as uh, Dmitry Trenin for um, two three years wrote that uh, Russia already operates as a as a kind of a state in war or close to war. And uh, NATO should should take into account absolutely that this will be this joining will be taken as an extremely extremely hostile step. So and then this is so this is the risk the risk after this will be tremendously. So it will be not uncertainty how we nicely put it or new normality uncertainty. It'll be it will be the risk the risk will be the risk I would say of everything. 
So, and this in this case, so this is this is again we have what we have. So, sorry, sorry for this. I'm I'm not very very optimistic about it. Although I'm an optimist, you see it. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. thanks, Irina. Um, so I will take the part uh, for the optimistic closing remarks. Um, so it may sound banal, but the, I think the bottom line from the uh, Geneva summit as well from uh, from the work in the cooperative security initiative is that we should enter into pragmatic negotiations, um, knowing all the red lines, uh, knowing all the difficulties uh, concerning unity in the EU or uh, the um, the uh, difficult Russian readiness, <laughs> uh, which is uh, not uh, always clear. Uh, but we kind of need to enter into pragmatic negotiations uh, without, a, without a sufficient level of trust, as we uh, saw uh, two days ago um, in Geneva. If the political will is there, then you can try and um, make such moves, make such initiatives. Because there are many worthwhile issues that can be regulated in this way, and that would improve our, all our lives. So even this, this, the small steps, not the big issues like NATO enlargement, not the uh, long-term, mid-term um, uh, steps, uh, which uh, uh, Lukas and we, um, uh, which Lukas presented at the beginning of our discussion, and to which you uh, you can um, read in our report. But uh, this small um, Worthwhile issues are important enough uh, from uh, my perspective, and that was kind of the tone of, of our discussion. Uh, that is always better than constantly listing threats and investing in, in even more deterrence. So, if you look at the strategic compass debate, uh, so this is based on threat perceptions, listing threat perceptions, uh, try to kind of uh, find a uh, uh, complementary list of uh, threat perceptions, but we should um, try to list more common interest and not uh, uh, common uh, threat perceptions. Uh, so this is, um, I think, uh, very important. And this is my uh, takeaway from, from our today's uh, lunch discussion. So um, on behalf of the Center for Eastern European and International Studies and the Regional Office for Cooperation and Peace in Europe of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. I would like to thank our guests today. So thank you very much. And many thanks also to the viewers who were present today, despite the fantastic weather <laughs> across Europe. Uh, um, and I hope we will see, see some of you again at our next lunchtime talks as part of the 30 post Soviet years series. So hashtag post uh, 30 post Soviet years. So stay tuned and uh, see you um, at the next uh, or yeah, at the next uh, lunch discussion and stay healthy. Bye bye from Vienna.